What if I told you that strength, not dexterity, is the best stat for a bleed build? That the Godskin Peeler is not the highest damage twin blade, and that the Scavengers and Bandits curved swords are not the highest damage curved swords? Thy strength befits the crown. Long and hard didst thou fight. What's up guys, welcome back to Titus Actual. If you guys are enjoying the video and you want to help the channel out, do us a huge favor and smash that like button and leave a comment with some feedback for us. And if you want to see more, then be sure to subscribe. Now in terms of stat optimization, Hero is actually the best class to start for this build, but you can still feel free to play the classic Samurai if you want to. While the build is stat optimized for level 150, we're also going to cover where you should go up to 200 in New Game Plus. Now I want to really quickly go over the stats that are important for this build. 50 Vigor should be more than enough, it's right between the soft cap of 40 and the hard cap of 60. Now since our bleed affinity weapons are going to scale directly off of strength, we're going to start at 62 strength and then immediately prioritize trying to get to the hard cap of 80 strength as soon as we can beyond level 150. Now we push Arcane to 45 because that's the major soft cap for blood loss buildup. Now pushing this build to level 200, you are going to take Arcane to 80 after strength to take advantage of the occult scaling, but we'll get more into that in a minute. Now Dexterity we only push to 18 to hit our requirements for our weapons. And 30 Endurance is a really good sweet spot in terms of being able to have enough stamina and wear enough armor to get the poise we need. Now if you're unfamiliar with Poison Elden Ring, all you really need to know is that it's the mechanic that prevents you from being staggered and interrupting your attack. The important breakpoint in PvE is 51 Poise that will allow you to finish your attack without being interrupted most of the time. So why Bleed? Why not a Colt or Heavy? It's because Bleed can increase your DPS by a ton, because every time that you proc a Bleed, you take 10% of a boss's total HP, plus an additional 1 or 200 damage depending on the weapon. Let's look at a really high HP boss to showcase what I mean. When we average out the blood loss across the damage per hit, we actually see the Bleed affinity doing almost 5 times the amount of damage per hit as the Occult affinity. Even crazier is that a non-upgraded Bleed Affinity Curve Sword is doing 4 times the damage of a maxed out Occult Affinity Curve Sword. Okay, so let's dive right into weapons because I know you guys are really excited about that. After doing a lot of research, it turns out that the God's Compeeler is not the strongest Twin Blade in the game. The strongest Twin Blade in the game is actually the Gargoyle's Twin Blade. This weapon is a reward at the end of the Valiant Gargoyle's boss fight in Seal for River, which means you won't have access to a second one until New Game Plus. But I do have a very good substitute weapon that you can use during your first playthrough in your offhand, and we'll cover that weapon in just a minute. As you can see in the gameplay of some of the boss fights going on behind me, the Gargoyle's Twin Blades do a ton of damage. Now keep in mind that most of these boss one-shot clips, I'm using quite a few buffs. At the very end of the video, I'm going to show the full Millennia one-shot, and that'll include the entire buff routine. I'm also going to cover a very simple buff routine, since most of you don't want to do an extended buff routine every fight. But for now, let's get back to what makes the Gargoyle's Twin Blades the best Twin Blade in the game. So looking at the numbers of an identical dexterity build with 62 dex and 45 arcane, we see right away that there's better stat scaling for strength on a Gargoyle's Twin Blade than there is for dex on a Godskin Peeler. Otherwise, these weapons are almost identical in almost every way, including blood loss buildup and weight. But this just leads to flat out more damage on a Gargoyle's Twin Blade. Even if we push strength, dex, and arcane to the hard caps of 80, we still see the same thing. The Gargoyle's Twin Blade is still more damage than the Godskin Peeler. Now looking back at these weapons on the stats for the first playthrough, we could see that the Twin Knight Swords deal almost the same damage as a Godskin Peeler would on a Dexterity build, and that's why I highly recommend that as your offhand weapon for your first playthrough. A great thing about that weapon is it's just ground loot, you can pick it up on the north side of Altus Plateau at any point in the game. So if you're looking to shed a little bit of weight, but you still want the same jumping power stance 4 hit attack, you're going to want the Beastman's Curved Swords. This is the best curved sword in the game for a bleed build. These weapons are farmed off the Azula Beastman in Crumbling Farm Azula. There's been a lot of popularity with curved swords and bleed builds, specifically the Bandit's curved swords and the Scavenger's curved swords. The Beastman curved sword is just flat out better than both. Curve swords are a really cool option to apply blood loss buildup because the jumping power stance attack hits four times like a twin blade. 
but they're faster and weigh a lot less than a twin blade. Now the main reason for the damage being better is once again the Beastman's Curved Sword just scale better off strength than the Bandit's and Scavenger's Curved Sword scale off of dexterity. One of the cooler aspects of this build is that the stats are set perfectly to take advantage of the scaling on the Mary's Executioner's Sword which is one of my favorite weapons in the entire game. When upgraded this weapon scales well with Arcane and extremely well with strength. The skill on the weapon is called Aokid's Dancing Blade. And as you can see, a single use of the skill will hit an enemy 12 times, making it an awesome weapon for one-shots. You can pick this weapon up as a reward from defeating Elmer the Briar in the Shaded Castle, so that means you have access to getting this weapon as early as you get to the Altus Plateau. The big downside to a traditional Dexterity Arcane Bleed build was that you lacked the strength to really take advantage of the primary stat scaling on this weapon because it's really one of the strongest weapons in the game. And what's even crazier is that I would consider this the second strongest weapon in the game, and the strongest weapon in the game actually scales even better with a strength arcane build than this one. Meaning that going strength arcane rather than dex arcane unlocks the two most powerful weapons in the game for you. Now a common misconception among strength build users is that a heavy giant crusher is the highest AR weapon in the game, and that's just simply not true. The heavy giant crusher has incredible strength scaling and gets incredible damage, but the single highest AR weapon in the game is actually an occult giant crusher. So with only 62 strength and 45 arcane, a two-handed occult giant crusher does 925 damage with no buffs. If you push this build up to level 200 with 80 strength and 80 arcane, two-handing an occult giant crusher will have a raw base damage of 1069. So with an incredible arsenal at our disposal, let's take a look at what kind of skills we want to be using on these weapons. If you've got any history with bleed builds in Elden Ring, then you know that the best skill that we can use on a bleed build is Seppuku. Even post nerf, Seppuku is amazing. Seppuku adds 30 flat physical attack power to your weapon, as well as 30 base bleed buildup that scales with your arcane. Seppuku is dropped by an invisible scarab on the frozen lake in Mountaintops of the Giants. And you can actually use it on both weapons if you two hand your left weapon and apply it there first. The first skill we grab in all of our bleed starter guides is Bloody Slash. This skill is dropped by the knight in Fort Height guarding the Dectus Medallion. The damage of Bloody Slash scales directly with the upgrade level of your weapon. So I think a lot of people overlook the damage potential because they get the skill so early when they don't have an upgraded weapon, and they don't think to go back and try it again later after upgrading. For those of you that have seen my one-shot challenge runs, you guys are no stranger to Royal Knight's Resolve. Found on a corpse in the Volcano Manor, Royal Knight's Resolve buffs the damage of the next landing swing by 80%. If you want to one-shot later game bosses, you're going to find yourself using Royal Knight's Resolve a lot of the time. Piercing Fang is acquired on the Nagakiba as part of Yura's questline. It has some one-shot potential and it's just a really cool aesthetically pleasing skill to use on your twin blades. It's obviously an optional skill for this build, but if you want to try it out, I definitely recommend it. Now on Fort Gill, you can pick up an Ash of War called Lion's Claw. Maybe I just love it because it reminds me of Artorius, but this is a pretty aesthetically pleasing skill as well. Let us know in the comments below what are some of your favorite skills that maybe weren't mentioned here that you think would fit this build well. Or let us know of another weapon you think might scale well. Now when it comes to armor, there's only three things that matter. The poise, the defense, and the aesthetics. On any bleed build, there's only ever one option for a helmet, and that's the white mask. The white mask raises all attack power by 10% for 20 seconds every time there's blood loss in the vicinity of your character. For a bleed build, that equates to basically a 10% permanent damage buff, especially since it's activated by using seppuku on yourself as well. Blade's armor gives us 28 poise, looks great, and has incredible poise to weight ratio. Blade's gauntlets give us 6 poise, match perfectly, and also have a great poise to weight ratio. And the final piece to our set, the Knight's Cavalry Greaves, bring us in 15 poise, pushing us past the 51 poise breakpoint, looking aesthetic, and keeping us in the medium roll, even with twin blades. Now here's a second setup for those really trying to min-max their damage. As we discussed already, the White Mask is mandatory for any bleed build, and gives us our first 5 poise. For your armor, you're going to want to go Raptor's Black Feathers, which increases your jump attack damage by 10%. If you really want to maximize damage with the Twin Blades and Curved Swords, then you want to run this setup and almost exclusively jump attack. You're going to want the Elden Lord Bracers for 4 poise and a great poise to weight ratio. And we really have to make up some ground with the 28 poise on the Bullgoat Greaves in order to hit the 51 poise breakpoint so that our attacks aren't getting interrupted all the time. Now obviously you can feel free to switch some of those around and get your fashion souls in, but I do highly recommend the White Mask and the Raptor's Black Feathers and try to hit the 51 poise breakpoint if you can. 
Talismans are a great way to stack a ton of extra damage or defense. And the best setup is going to depend on the weapon you're running, so let's first look at the power stance of Twin Blades or Curved Swords. Lord of Blood's Exaltation is to Talismans what the White Mask is to armor. It just provides even more damage. This talisman raises your attack power by 20% for 20 seconds every time there's blood loss. The Claw Talisman stacks with the Raptor's Black Feathers and it increases jump attack damage by 15%. This is a great option for Curved Swords and Twin Blades which hit 4 times with a jumping L1. The Rotten Wing Sword Insignia is another great option for this setup because it raises attack power with successive attacks by 6, 8, and then 13% and you'll be doing a lot of successive attacks. Now before you get to New Game Plus, I highly recommend your last talisman slot be the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, which flat out reduces all incoming physical damage by 20%. That's the equivalent of having 20% more HP. Now if you're in New Game Plus and you want to maximize the damage of your Twin Blade or Curved Sword build, you want to run Millicent's Prosthesis in your last talisman slot. This raises attack power with successive attacks by 4, 6, and 11%. But you'll need to be in New Game Plus to get both this and the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia. Now if you want to maximize the damage of your Aerial Kid's Dancing Blade, you're going to swap your first talisman out with the Shard of Alexander. This talisman boosts the attack power of all skills by 15%. You get this upon finishing Alexander's quest line. If you go and kill Godfrey in the Everjail in the Altus Plateau, you're going to get the Godfrey Icon. This raises the attack power of charge spells and skills by 15%. And then we want to keep our successive attack talismans because of how many times the Aokid's Dancing Blade hits. Now when you're running the Giant Crusher, the only talisman that matters is the Axe Talisman, which increases charged attack damage by 10%. This talisman has nothing to do with skills, this is just applied to the charged R2 attack of the Giant Crusher itself. So if you're trying to boost the damage of a skill of something like let's say Bloody Slash, you just want to use the Shard of Alexander instead. These are the buffs that I recommend for those of you that want something quick and not a long extravagant buff routine. We'll start off with our flask. The strength knot tier is available early and it gives us a big damage boost via stat scaling on our weapons and puts us 10 strength closer to the hard cap. The thorny crack tier increases consecutive attack damage by 9, 13, and 20% and swap out the spike crack tier for the giant crusher for 15% more damage on charged attacks. The Blood Bowl Aromatic takes 1 second to use and gives you 30% more damage for 60 seconds. The Rallying Standard also takes very little time and provides a 20% damage buff for 30 seconds. And then of course we want to use Seppuku for the 30 flat physical damage, the Blood Loss buildup, and triggering the 10% buff from the White Mask and the 20% buff from the Lord of Blood's Exaltation. These buffs will skyrocket your damage and I'll show you in real time now just how quick they are to apply. Now as you can see, with just those 4 quick buffs, you can make extremely fast work of any boss. I also wanted to showcase that you can still do additional damage to a boss while they're in the dying animation, as well as the power of sleep pots to turn the tide in your favor in some of the harder boss fights. Speaking of sleep pots, it's going to be the first consumable that I would recommend for this build. The sleep buildup per tick on a sleep pot actually scales with arcane so they're awesome for this build. And sleep pots allow for some really cool boss kills. Bukhari provide a nice ranged option. They cause blood loss buildup that stacks with your weapons. They could be bought rather than farmed as well which is nice. If you want another cool way to switch things up and cause blood loss, the swarm pot is pretty cool. It does a decent amount of damage and causes blood loss and both the damage and blood loss buildup scale off of arcane. Alright, for those of you that want to push it as far as you can and recreate the Melania one-shot, you're going to start off drinking your flask with your Strength Knot tier and your Thorny Crack tier. Then you're going to start building up your Frenzy. You can also use a Frenzy Flamestone, which doesn't require any stats to use. This is in preparation for your Black Dumpling Helm. Once you've built up a good amount of Frenzy, you're going to go ahead and use your Blood Boil Aromatic. And then you're going to use your flask to refill your FP. Then you want to finish building up your Madness the rest of the way to proc your Black Dumpling Helm. And then as soon as you finish the madness animation, you're going to want to switch to your white mask. Then you're going to refill your FP again and use the Golden Vow Ash of War. We're using this in place of the Commander Standard for this fight because it lasts a lot longer. At this point, you're going to refill your FP and use a Rope Fetid Pot to start building up some poison. Then you're going to use Seppuku to proc the damage buff from the white mask and the Lord of Blood's Exaltation. And then while you're transitioning through the Fog Gate, you're going to switch to the Mushroom Crown and the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation. Then quickly use a Rope Fetid Pot to proc your Kindred of Rot's Exaltation and Mushroom Crown, and switch to your Millicent's Prosthesis.
Now you want to quickly re-equip the Mushroom Crown and the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation and self-poison again with Rope Fetid Pots, and then use the Neutralizing Bolus and switch back to Millicent's Prosthesis. Okay, so now I want to showcase the level 200 build and how we go about one-shotting stuff with the Twin Blades and Curved Swords. Like we discussed earlier, the major changes at level 200 is just getting Strength and Arcane to level 80, Strength being the priority. Now to start things off here, we're going to start building up our Frenzy and drink our Flask. Now I also want to note that the only time you're going to be using a Colt like we are here is when enemies are immune to Bleed, or when you're trying to one-shot things in your level 200 with 80 Arcane. Bleed is better in every other scenario for the reasons that we discussed earlier, even in one-shot scenarios because you get an extra 10% damage on the boss. Now right before the Madness Bar fills, you're going to use Blood Boil Aromatic so that that and Black Dumpling Helm both proc at the same time, because they're both 60 second buffs. Then you're going to want to refill your FP, switch to the White Mask, and use your Commander Standard. Then you're going to refill your FP again, and build up some poison with a Rope Fetid Pot. Use Seppuku to proc your White Mask and Lord of Blood's Exaltation, then remove your Standard and Seppuku weapon. Switch to the Mushroom Crown and the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation and poison yourself with a Rope Fetid Pot. And then switch to your Millicent's Prosthesis. At this point you have all your buffs, so just put Royal Knight Resolve on both weapons and send it. Don't forget to use your neutralizing boluses at the end so that you don't die from the poison. And this is pretty much the exact buff routine used for every clip that was used in this build guide. Also for those of you that are new to the game, there's going to be a playlist linked in the description with all the item location guides. Alright guys, I hope you found this guide to be both informative and entertaining. If you did, do us a big favor and smash the like button. And if you want to see more guides like this, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification icon. If you guys haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you go check out our last video. It was a level 1 one-shot challenge run. We'll catch you guys in the next video. Until then, stay dangerous.